Make sure that it's still online, because if it's not online, you can't present. Yeah, that's weird. All right, you're good. All right, and everyone's back from lunch? Right, OK. <laughs> Some of us never come back from lunch. <laughs> lunch is a state of being. Uh, OK, so uh, let's get started. Uh, this is, uh, we're going to talk about the library structure number five. We're going to get into uh, protocols layer three. That's what we're going to be focusing on. And um, without further ado, let's just get started. So remember this uh, overall picture of the, the libraries that we have. And this is where we are now uh, in protocol. So we've gone through uh, all the way through uh, this core library, which is these five. We've talked about protocols one. And now we're in this third level. Yes? Uh, where are we going to start talking about proteins? <laughs> it's not on the slide. <laughs> Um, we're going to talk a little bit about proteins right now. So um, get ready. Edging towards proteins? Like, did we go through the protocol layer? Or? Yes. Yeah, OK. So I mean, we talked about proteins when we got to core three. We talked about yeah, poses. Like the bowl tree, that was kind of protein. <laughs> we talked about proteins a lot, just very uh, technically. All right, so um, I can use the word more. <laughs> OK. All right, so this is a, where we are. And if you're using um, some IDEs, you'll, your uh, libraries will be split out. And you'll see, so this is where uh, to look for the things we're going to be talking about right now. Uh, so what I want to kind of focus in on is uh, sampling techniques. Uh, so now we have a score function, a minimizer, packer, job distributor, scripting interface, and this mover base class. We can finally start to model some proteins. Uh, you kind of need all of these pieces to be able to make a Rosetta protocol. So um, now I kind of want to give a little bit of a greatest hits of what we have to uh, change backbone confirmations and some of the more advanced uh, techniques. And finally, we're going to uh, come back to uh, sort of an example of what happens if you uh, just really focus on writing code quickly and not on designing it well, and uh, some consequences that can have when your abstraction starts to break down. Um, so that's the loops code. So uh, there's a directory in Protocol 3 called Simple Moves, and it contains broadly useful movers. Uh, so there are useful movers in many contexts. We have the backbone mover, which is a base class, and that has a small mover and a shear mover. And we talked about what those kinds of moves were uh, when we talked about um, relaxation uh, briefly the other day. Um, there's min pack movers. Uh, they pack and minimize side chains. So that's uh, something that you're going to want to be doing a lot to find uh, to make sure that you're getting a good understanding of uh, how good a certain confirmation is. Um, the return sidechain mover is something that I think is really useful. Um, for instance, when you want to um, move back from a centroid representation to a full atom representation, you might want to include some of the sidechains that you started off with in particular places. Um, yeah, so you can stop at any point in time and say, uh, remember the confirmation of all my sidechains, and then get them back later if you want to. Uh, a switch residue typeset mover, that's how you go between a uh, uh, reduced representation called centroid and this all atom representation. Uh, yeah, I wish I could see the next slide on this, but you can't. <laughs> um, so there are more. So let's continue the, the, the greatest hits. There's a superimpose mover, so you can just kind of give it a reference pose and a pose, and they have to be the same. Um, you can't mutate side chains and still pass it through this, but Basically, you can give it two different confirmations of something with the same sequence, and it'll superimpose them and compute the RMSD between those different states. Um, and you can use something called an atom ID map and say, these are the atoms that I care about. So um, for example, if you wanted to get a good loop RMSD, if you move a loop a whole bunch, you might want to superimpose the rest of the protein and exclude the, root, the loop from the superposition and then compute the RMSD over that. So you can do that with this. Uh, and again, you have to have the same number of atoms, not the same number of residues, atoms in each residue. So same residue type. Uh, there's a fragment mover. And that's how you do fragment insertion to sample different conformations. Uh, and there's a constraint set mover. And uh, that basically gives a con puts a constraint set onto a pose, which you can then use for scoring. And we're going to talk about constraints on Friday, just tomorrow. Wow. All right, there's even more. Uh, there's a pack rotomers mover. So you can uh, just say, let's pack these rotomers through a mover interface, which is a little bit 
which might be convenient depending on exactly how you're interacting with Rosetta. For example, if you're using Rosetta scripts, this is how you're going to do it. Uh, there's a min mover. Uh, it calls the minimizer uh, with a move map. So you can say, I want these things to be allowed to move. Let's minimize. And then all the symmetry movers are here. Uh, so that's uh, how you can set up for symmetry. And if there's um, special flavors of some of the uh, simple move movers, they all live here too. So the simple moves directory has lots of really useful stuff that you're probably going to want to incorporate as a piece of an algorithm in the future. So make sure to just go through there and, and look over it. Uh, there's also something called simple filters. I'm not going to go over the details of all of these, but basically a filter uh, has an apply method and it returns a bool instead of void. So uh, true if the, some criterion is met, false if it's not. Uh, it's really good for making sure that any decoy that you're writing out, or if at any point in your algorithm you want to say, this must be so. Um, look through that directory, you'll see lots of cool examples, and you can make new ones that do anything. Question. Yes? Um, if you go ahead. I can. Uh, so let's say you're running an instruct 10,000, mm -hmm. and you have some filter that you only care about low energy uh, structures. Will it keep trying to generate? So that's kind of up to you. Um, if you tell, so you can respond to a failed filter however you want. Uh, there's a mover status that we didn't really talk about, probably should have. Um, you can basically say that the mover failed, retry, fail, do not retry. And so if you say do not retry, it says, okay, <laughs> I won't try again. Um, but if you keep telling it to keep going, you will end up with 10,000 structures that meet your criteria. <laughs> So that might take forever um, if it's a really strict criteria. Like if it, you know, but you have to be able to describe something about your, uh, the confirmation that you want to measure. How do you, how do you um, have the simple filters interact with the mover? With what? With the mover. With the mover? Uh, you would instantiate one inside of a mover okay. and then just call it. So you just, the pose that, you're, that you've just uh, changed the confirmation of, you just pass that on to the mover and say apply and get the status. There's also this uh, directory called Toolbox that has tools in it. Um, <laughs> we got really good at naming things when we got to the protocols level. Uh, so there's task operations, and we talked about these when we talked about packing. But not all task operations can exist in core four. Uh, so we put another task operations directory here for things that are common uh, that can exist in this library, and they're registered to that factory. Um, just like the mover factory that we did when we made uh, a pilot app on the, on the first day. Uh, so here's some tom uh, common task operations that, are, that exist in the protocols toolbox directory. Uh, there's a restrict to interface operation. So if you want to only uh, repack sidechains or design sidechains, uh, add an interface between two chains, you can uh, just call this task operation and you're good to go. Uh, you can select by solve an accessible surface area operation, uh, restrict to neighborhood operation. So you can say, within some distance away from these residues, also repack. Um, and there's a restricted repacking operation. So you can say, I don't want to design, period. And then restrict by calculators. Um, and so these calculators are pose metric calculators. I'm going to talk about them uh, next. OK. So pose metric calculators, uh, there's this class down in a core pose metrics. Uh, that's an abstract based class. And there are two major flavors. There's a structure dependent calculator and an energy dependent calculator. Um, and they're both abstract. They just kind of uh, explain what kind of calculation you're going to be doing. And this is kind of a way of saying, I want to know something about the pose. And I'm just going to describe this as uh, this calculator. And you get a number back out of it, or a vector of numbers. Or you can describe how you want that information to come back. Um, and so these, some of these things are used for uh, that task operation, where you might want to compute something and then make a decision about which residues you want to pack based on that. So they're also pretty useful, um, but they're rather specific. Um, 
So it didn't seem uh, like a good idea to get it too into any one of them. But again, go through and look at them and um, see how they work. It should be pretty clear at this point. Um, all right, I want to talk about relax. What? I'm also interested in knowing like, when loops get rejected. Like, do you use the, the so you can invoke a calculator at any point, but you have to instantiate it first. So you have to, when you're writing a mover, you need to know, um, at this point, I want to calculate something. Or you know, if you make a filter that has a calculator, um, that, cal that filter needs to have a, an instance of that calculator inside of it. And that's going to be part of how it's making its decision to filter or not. Okay, so now we're going to talk about relax. Um, so why do we want to relax? Um, if you're starting with something that came from uh, an experimental structure, the uh, atomic coordinates aren't determined to an infinite precision. There are errors in that process. And even if they were absolutely correct, um, our score function is not. So the problem with this is that you can get a structure that looks really close to something that Rosetta would think is great and does not score well. So what we want to do is find a way to move this into a, a local minima uh, without moving the structure very much. So we can kind of start off in a Rosetta-friendly confirmation instead of nature's confirmation. So yeah, we're going to find nearby energy minima, hopefully get into that without preparing the backbone too much. So uh, there are many flavors of relax, but I'm going to talk about fast relax. Um, there's also something called classic relax, but that's deprecated. Um, it's a little better than fast relax, but it's, uh, I thought the end result is a little better, but it takes way longer, so don't do it. Um, you're better off just running more, uh, running fast relax for a little longer if you were going to do that, more cycles of that. That was my understanding. Okay. Exactly, but if you're just going to run like the standard uh, configuration, you typically get a little bit better of a right. That's what I, I've. My understanding is that you get um, you get almost as good results in way less time. And if you run for as much time, you get better. Results. Oh, definitely. I don't mean to say that it wouldn't be the case, but yeah. Um, so the fast relax algorithm can be described or is described as a ramp repack minimize. Um, many cycles. Of that, and what we mean by uh, ramp is that you're gonna, uh, when you first start, you're gonna turn way down the uh, the repulsive term, and then each ramp step you increase that a little bit until you get all the way back to where it started. And uh, so then you, we're gonna make this uh, repulsive term a little higher. I'm gonna repack the side chains. Whoa. Uh, repack the side chains, and then we're gonna minimize. And the default minimization uh, algorithm is the DFP min. Army Joe, not in monotone. Uh, why, why do you increase the repulsion? So what happens is um, when you first turn it way down um, and you minimize, everything kind of and then you slowly increase it and it's going to take a different path right. out. So that's uh, how we're going to, and then we're going to you know, accept these moves or not. So basically what we're going to do is find the minima that's nearby. Is this what real, is this the real is this what it does? That's what it does. And it does this, uh, I think, Five times is the, the fast, fast relax, and then the long, fast relax is 15 times it is. And you can control that with a flag. It's pretty well documented, so if you just Google Rosetta fast relax, I think our documentation is the first hit, which is nice. <laughs> OK. That's all I really want to say about relax. It's important. It's a pretty simple algorithm, and that's nice. Um, I want to talk about fragment picking a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to get too much into the details of how the picker works itself. That's detailed in uh, uh, Dominic's plus one paper, um, and it's complicated. Uh, but I want to explain what it does. So we want to sample new confirmations by using chunks of known structures that we call fragments. Uh, they're typically three residues long and nine residues long, but you can use any length. Uh, this is just kind of a convention or an artifact of history at this point. Uh, but that being said, three residues is a pretty good minimum. Uh, 
uh, because it includes all the backbone dihedral angles for that central residue. So you might not want to go to two. And uh, fragments are going to be selected in accordance to the predicted secondary structure of the sequence that you're interested in. So um, those weights of exactly how we're going to balance these different secondary structure predictions are completely uh, configurable, but there are some defaults provided. So if you want to make a fragment set, which is what the fragment picker, uh, is, the fragment insertion is going to be able to use, uh, you need to use a whole bunch of third-party tools um, and set up this 1,500-line Perl script that comes with Rosetta. Um, is this like a, is that official? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so if you ever look on the forums for make, uh, making fragments, people are like, what? <laughs> and that's really that's the question and the answer. Um, yeah, it's <laughs> uh, so it is not for the faint of heart. Um, <laughs> But the, uh, the Robetta server is, is, is really popular, and it might be worthwhile to actually go through the steps of setting this up if you want to use fragments. Um, question? Yeah. Uh, what are the code I'm going I'm I'm to go over them in the next slide. Yeah, and we change them up. Okay. Which, one, uh, which ones you need to do and, and all that stuff. Um, but yeah, so I think that because this uh, server ends up being pretty backed up, it's nice to be able to say, I want fragments now. So we're going to go over a little bit about the configuration. Um, there is a um, C++ fragment picker now. Pretty well uh, And so it's worth looking into if you're interested in the fragment a lot. Right. That's what, I, I, oh, sorry. that's what I'm talking about. But you still need to use make fragments to use it. To generate the uh, secondary structure uh, prediction profiles that you can compare to set up the quota to pick the fragments, you need to do all of this still. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You can do it on the fly if you want, but it's not recommended. Um, so you can do it in advance and then load the fragment set in once. If there's a better way, I'd love to hear it. <laughs> um, so here's what you need. The NCBI C toolkit, not the C++ one, the C one. Uh, the non-redundant BLAST database, Cypred, SAM, Predict Second, and JUFO. That's optional. And also Porter. That's also optional. Uh, secondary structure prediction uh, algorithms. Uh, JUFO comes from the Myler lab, and Porter comes from somebody. But they don't distribute code, and they only give out an executable if you get your PI to send them an email. That's been my experience. I asked and uh, got no response, and I said, man, I don't know what to do. And Jeff was like, I'll email them. And that got a response. So maybe I got junked. <laughs> it happens. Uh, but anyway, so these are, these are optional. You can, run, you can run it without these two. Um, but these ones are critical. Whoa, that's creepy. <laughs> Google. <laughs> OK, so after you compile all these things, um, and in the case of Sam, you need to go, and there's a configuration file. You need to edit all these paths to point it to your other executables that you built. Then you need to go into this make fragments Perl script and um, point all the paths to the copies of these things that you have on your machine. And after that, it's pretty easy. And you just get to run it. So um, let's not talk about fragments anymore. Uh, now let's talk about loops. Uh, so first, some, some background to kind of motivate the problem. Uh, predicting confirmation of loop regions is challenging. Um, it's really important for homology modeling, as we typically think of these insertions uh, as loops that we can model. Uh, and we can kind of, uh, if we can get good models of this, they can provide some insight into uh, why certain protein interactions happen and which residues are important to them. So it's really important to be able to generate um, really accurate models for loops. OK. Uh, they have a very large conformational space. Um, 
as the, the length of the loop incre uh, expands, the space increases exponentially. And for that reason, um, existing algorithms are accurate to a, up about uh, 12 residues. Every now and again, you see something that is successful in a little bit longer, but those seem to be sort of few and far between um, or really, really new. I think next generation kick claims to do a little bit longer than 12, right? I think, I think usually, like the next generation, like 14. 14, right. Um, but some loops are like 20 residues long. So um, this is still a, an area of active uh, interest, and we're trying to, to make these things um, more robust, be able to do bigger problems. So there are several uh, loop modeling techniques that are kind of built into Rosetta at this point, and they involve different sampling strategies and different loop closure strategies to try and find low energy conformations that uh, have chemical connectivity. Uh, so he, the two major classes of algorithms are identified by the closure technique, and so we call them kick, and that um, randomly perturbs a loop conformation and then computes an analytical solution uh, to find a closed conformation. Uh, so it has some pivot residues, and then it says, how do I have to adjust these to make a new closed loop conformation? And there's really fancy math that it does. It's the robot arm. Um, it's a different, they're both robot arms, uh, this and CCD. But this is like a, uh, yeah, it's like a 16 order polynomial, and then there's a bunch of solutions, and it's pretty cool. But imagine the, the kind of, Older robots, where they would pick something up and you kind of see them like, that's the that's the other one, that's CCD, and kicks the one where the robot just is and like grabs something out of the air. Um, so that's the the kind of the math that these are are doing. Um, so the other one is CCD. It stands for cyclic coordinate descent. So that's the one where the robot's, you know, optimizing this thing, and it's, so it's cyclic. It just keeps going over the different joints. And so the way we think about this is that there's fragment insertion in a low resolution mode, and then uh, we use this cyclic coordinate descent in low resolution, and then we do small perturbations in high resolution, followed by uh, the CCD closures. Yeah, they they generate some really fancy polynomial. It's like sixteen order, right? Yep. And I think you said about six real solutions. So. Pretty fancy math. <laughs> uh, yeah. uh, there's a Nature Methods paper that it's kind of in the supplemental, but it's there. Yeah. Um, so here's the loop relax mover. It's not actually in protocols three, but it's what you're going to be interacting with when you use the loop model application. And it has something called an independent loop mover and then something called a loop mover. Uh, and so this loop relax mover is actually what's running these different strategies that we're talking about. So um, this is what the inheritance for this looks like. Uh, so we start off with this abstract class called a loop mover. And we inherit another abstract class called an independent loop mover. That's what we use for low resolution loop modeling. And then from here, we have something for kick, and for CCD, and then something called quick CCD. And then we have these concrete movers that are typically used for refinement. OK, so there's lots of inheritance, lots of different classes. Um, and each one of these loop movers is a complete loop modeling routine. Um, and a lot of them are really similar to each other. Um, for instance, well, actually, we're just going to go over it. Uh, basically, what they do in their apply is they're going to set up a fold tree to make sure that the, uh, the motion is directed uh, or localized to the loop region. And then they're going to initialize a whole bunch of bookkeeping objects, like a Monte Carlo object. Um, and they have a double for loop. And basically, the outer loop is responsible for um, adjusting some parameter. Uh, so this is kind of a ramp type of effect. And it's typically the chain break and uh, the temperature that they're going to ramp in this outer loop. And then there's an inner loop. And the inner loop is responsible for the actual sampling. Uh, it has to make sure that the backbone is continuous at the end of the, of the iteration. And it performs all the optimization, packing, minimization. Um, and it has to keep track of which conformations it's seen, so it uses, using the Monte Carlo object. OK. So in fact, these algorithms are attempting to solve really similar problems. Uh, the, so that the actual algorithms look really similar. If you put them, if you just kind of look at the code, they're 
really similar, uh, do this, do that, do this, for loop, for loop. Uh, so here's the job of it. It's perturb the backbone, close the loop, refine the loop, um, and possibly some neighboring residues. Uh, like we talked about that restrict to vicinity uh, task operation. Right? So you want to repack things that the loop might be in contact with now. And then we'll apply some filter and make sure that's good. So you can see that we're building this kind of complex algorithm out of all these pieces that we've talked about so far. Uh, so this code base sort of ignores an important principle of object-oriented code development, and that's find what varies and encapsulate it. Right? So uh, everything has been duplicated because each, out, each mover re-implements uh, re it. So what's so bad about that? Um, and I wanted to question and answer right now. So really, what's bad about duplicating the code instead of having uh, a more rigidified abstraction? Well, if you make a change in one place, and then you have to remember that and that thing is also present in the other case, you have to remember to change it back here. Right, so things that should be similar are now diverging. Just because you've forgotten that it was in the other place to begin with. Right. I do that when I write little hack little scripts and yeah. reuse the code. It's terrible. It's that's, so that's one problem. Yeah. Can also, you? If there are little changes that are important and meant to be there, it's not as clear as they are. So there's two problems. What else? What if you want to use just a part of one of the algorithms? What if you want to mix two of uh, the parts that, make that, are, that are actually different together? It becomes extremely difficult uh, when you haven't really broken it down into these bite-sized chunks. So uh, right now, we're, at, we're actually as a process to refactor this. So um, we're going to talk about and a little bit about what we might want to do to make this better. And we're going to talk about what we came up with um, in February and see how those things kind of uh, agree. So the problems, bugs are duplicated. Uh, further duplication is encouraged because it's a really difficult problem to just say, oh, well, now I need to refactor all of this and make this like this. And now I can do the thing I really want to do, as opposed to just saying, I could copy and paste this. Um, and the code's inflexible. And uh, how would you even go about writing an algorithm that can randomly choose to use CCD or kick? So in this framework, what would you have to do to make that happen? Yeah, if you wanted to flip a coin and do one closure algorithm or another, how would you do that uh, when everything is duplicated as it is? You get the whole new mover. Take back the other code again. So that's one way of doing that. You can a new class, right? So you can subclass. Inherit both of those. Whoa, 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 we don't do multiple inheritance. Because <laughs> then you get two reference counts. It's, it's, don't do that. It also, <laughs> it also works because the apply functions are monolithic. Right, so the other way would be to go through both, both pieces of code, pull it out, make a different function that does uh, one of those things, put it in a utility thing that you can include in your code, and then you can pick. And that's just a lot more work than it should be. So uh, this is a problem. Um, it's a problem with the design of the code. Uh, and it started off as a really good design, and then as it kind of got bigger and bigger and bigger, different things started varying. And that's, that's why this happened. It wasn't a bad design from the beginning. Um, so let's think about what a better design for this might be. Right, so you want to find the pieces that are similar and make, put them in one place. And what's the other step? No, I'm thinking about how would you fix the problem of inflexibility, the problem of code duplication at the, at the same time, and then make it so that you can do um, other things in the future that, uh, that really let you focus on that new functionality and not on uh, refactoring existing code. Right, so what you're saying, 
So let me rephrase it. It's basically find the things that are different and encapsulate them. Right? So first it's find things that are the same and put them into a common place, and then find the things that are different and allow them to be selected really easily. So that's basically what, uh, what we did, uh, what we came up with. Um, so a few of us sat down at Minicon in February in a room and just kind of yelled at each other until we came up with a solution that we think will work. Um, and so we came up with a class called Atomic Loop Mover. And it's atomic, like uncuttable, not like carbon. Um, and so each existing algorithm is going to be a, a specific configuration of this shared interface that's going to be common to all loop movers. Uh, so the question for you guys now is, will this class be, bless you, um, abstract or concrete? What do you think? What is an abstract class? Like, um, mover is an abstract class. You can't make an instance of it. Right, so be, that's one way of doing that. Um, and the way we're doing this is actually going to be a concrete class. Uh, you're going to be able to instantiate, and it's just a configuration that's different. So I'll get into that a little bit more. So it's going to have the following data members, something called a sampler, something called a closer, something called a refiner, something called a filter. <coughs> uh, so these are each classes, and then they have many subclasses each. So depending on which sampler you give to the atomic loop mover, it'll sample differently. Depending on which closer you give to this, it'll close differently. So it's kind of, this uh, is very general now. It just knows that I'm going to sample, and I'm going to close, and I'm going to refine, and I'm going to filter. It doesn't know how it's going to do those things. That's all um, placed into these uh, objects. So um, of these, uh, which ones do you guys think are going to be abstract? Right, OK. So the sampler is going to be responsible for sampling different backbone uh, confirmations. The closer is responsible for making sure that the, the chain is continuous. Um, the refiner is going to be responsible for doing minimization, packing, selecting whether or not neighbors are going to be included in those optimizations. And then the filter says at the very end, um, this is good enough. Oh yeah, these are all classes. Okay. Right. So if there's a unified set of parameters, then this can be concrete. Right. Yeah. What about the others? Uh, refiner could be the same, right? If there's a unified way of doing this and it's uh, configurable enough. Yeah. Yeah. yeah Sample is going to be, uh, right. be abstract, right? And we're going to inherit from it, and each subclass is going to be different. And closer, and closer will also be abstract? Yep, exactly. Yeah. So we're going to have a couple of abstract classes and a couple of maybe concrete classes if they always do the same thing. Um, so that's the way that's going to be set up. So we're going to make the following samplers. There's a null sampler. It doesn't do anything. A Gaussian sampler, which sort of just picks numbers off of a distribution. Uh, a Ramachandran sampler, which can sample from a Ramachandran distribution. A two-body Ramachandran sampler, fragment sampler, loop hash sampler, and a back rub sampler. So now all these things which were um, associated with particular closers followed by refiners are now kind of free to be mixed matched with whatever they want to be. 
And as far as closers go, we have a null closer. It doesn't do anything um, in case you have something that can guarantee that it's always closed uh, in the sampling step. Um, a kinematic closer for kick, CCD closer for CCD, and a constraint closer, which will make a lot more sense when we talk about constraints tomorrow. Um, so the, the filters and refiners we thought of so far are a lot more generalized. So um, the filters are used to make sure that the loop closure was successful and can include a couple of additional criteria. It's not entirely clear what those are all going to be just yet. Um, and the refiners can repack, and they can have a task factory, and that's where the variation is going to come in there. Um, and they can minimize uh, using a move map. So we think that something like this is a really different set of uh, way of organizing. It's going to allow uh, the new loop modeling routines that we want to build to be built from the other pieces. So just like we want to be able to use movers and filters and uh, minimizers and all these things to build up new algorithms. We want to be able to use these different pieces for the loop movers and build new loop modeling algorithms too. And the thing that we really like about this is that you could even start to imagine building new configurations within a Rosetta script parser uh, XML file. So uh, if it's sufficiently flexible, you can just start saying, do this, do that, do this other thing, and then it'll do something that's not even uh, written up in C++. So uh, let me tell you a little bit what this was supposed to demonstrate. Um, if you really think about like, the kind of use cases, uh, you can make decisions that are going to make it easier to make new algorithms in the future, uh, and that can allow you to make quick changes and test things really quickly and accurately. So you don't have to worry about, um, well, if I want to try this thing, I have to write a whole bunch of code. Now it's just a matter of configuring something a little bit differently, and then you can run a test and uh, do it that way. Um, so what are the consequences of this? And that font size got smaller. Um, the multitude of these loop mover subclasses are going to be replaced with just atomic loop mover. Um, and in fact, in the existing classes, there's a bug in the way that packing was set up, and that was duplicated. So it was even more than just a something might go wrong, something was wrong. Uh, and so breaking code into bite-sized chunks is a good idea. And uh, I hope that's something that um, you guys can take out of this. Uh, when you go back to your labs. And um, oh, so this, uh, this bug was propagated in other pieces of the code, too, because of the duplication. Um, and they were really hard to track down. So we can make new algorithms by combining existing steps. And uh, you can't do this right now. So this is something that we think is a really big improvement. and. Uh, that's about it for that. Uh, are there any questions? I know this is kind of like um, a case study almost, uh, instead of talking about sort of how to go about making decisions. So um, I think we should have a quick conversation about what uh, what to do in the future. Yeah, I have a question. So I think all around Rosetta so there is a lot of duplication, right? Um, maybe. Even a small <laughs> one, maybe. <laughs> oh, um, no, it's. Uh, I mean, I think it's hard to actually know. Uh, what it would take to make them to generalize a lot of the things that might look yeah, like to duplicate. Yeah, almost over any protocol, you can find chunks of code that actually have been implemented through some other process, right? I mean, sure. I think yeah, yeah, yeah. 90%. Is there any plan for making something like this for protocols? So I think what happens is that someone's going to come along and they're going to say, I need to use this, mm -hmm. and I can't. <laughs> and then they'll try and find other people <laughs> who also want to do that but can't. And then they will sit down and fix it. Um, like that's what's happening right now. I know, uh, Tim's involved in this. Kale's involved in this. Um, and we're all in different labs. So it's it's more of a matter of um, a bunch of people agreeing that there's a problem. So there's not a, a systematic way really of detecting this kind of duplication outright that I'm aware of. Um, Andrew might have more to say about that. It's, it's our problem. Optimizes for edge cases B and D, so if you duplicate it, you now need something that does 
A, B, C, and D precisely as well as the previously duplicated code. And that can be, is usually possible, but can be very, very time consuming. So if you want to do it, it's a cool code. Yeah. I think we generally encourage people to, you know, if you see a way to improve code, do it. Um, it requires only the will to do so. Yeah. So, freedom. It's definitely good to talk to other people about it. As yeah. Uh, to give them the heads up that you're going to be modifying. Uh, that that uh, can generate a lot of goodwill. Uh, as opposed to not telling them that you're going to change the main code, especially if you're going to break the code. Mm -hmm. um, and that can generate a lot of goodwill. Can you give me an example that you're planning to change it, or can I just change the whole thing and then share it with them that okay, this is the final version? Do you think so what you <laughs> might have to do? What well, you might want to do, um, you might be about to say the same thing. I think I am. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. um, so now that we have Git, um, make a branch, make a change, tell the person, and ask for their opinion. Um, and don't merge back into the, the master branch until you've had a conversation with that person. And then they can review the changes that you made, decide what their workflow. This is something that's been in progress with some of the database code. Is there's a, a large change underway. Yeah, so that's one of the uh, was one of the motivating things about switching to Git is that right now it's kind of one branch, right? There's this trunk. So if you if you change it and make it available, it's it's there for everyone. It's the way to do it. So with this, we're hoping that you can make something in parallel. Say, we th I think this is better, and get an opinion. And, uh, just not to prolong the discussion, but uh, I was thinking if I make something and if the person I talk to just completely disagrees with my point of view, but I'm pretty convinced this is how it should. I mean, I don't know if situations like this arise. Like, is there a standard way, like the person who made the code first days? Um, Rosetta Con deathmatch is the <laughs> official way of dealing with that. Yeah, and I would practice with the weapons before you get there. A lot of people make that mistake and they just think that they'll pick up what this. Yeah, like, yeah, nunchucks. How hard could that be? It's surprisingly hard to use a sword. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, um, if, that's, if it's a real problem, like if someone says, um, this breaks my use case, um, I think that we, we would tolerate duplication of concepts for, for those purposes. Because you should be able to, you should write, you should be able to do your science, they should be able to do their science. Um, that's the real purpose of what we're doing here. And there are often debates about. Yeah. It's hard when the debate uh, goes to is this an improvement? Um, that's when things get tricky. <laughs> but yeah, it's happened. Any more questions? I think that when you're writing large pieces of code, it's really important to make sure that you uh, maintain some flexibility without completely over engineering it. So there is sort of a balance to this. And, we might have gone to the towards the other side of that. Uh, yeah. One more question. So, uh, just nowadays, is people putting code in, in the core, or there is no more code? Uh, I mean, more code being added uh, add to, to the core. People put code put code in core. Um, so. Typically, so it has to belong there, um, and knowing exactly what that means uh, takes some amount of familiarity with the code base in a general sort of way. But I heard there's a lot of code that uh, should be in core and it's in protocols now, right? Um, we, that core is too big. No, no, no. It's, it's more that um, we like to make sure that things kind of live uh, where they should go. So if, if you have, for instance, if you have a task operation that might only be used by your code. Uh -huh. um, you might not want to put that in core unless it's generally useful for other applications and just hasn't been written yet. Okay. Um, but you might want to put it there anyway because you say it belongs there. So um, you there's. Want to put code as high in the library as it makes sense. Right? Write it as gen I mean, if you have something that's very general. So uh, I guess um, yeah, there, there are two ways that you can think about approaching a big project. One where you create a, a directory in protocols and uh, you've got your big project and you put every file that you're going to develop up into that and every subroutine and every class in that directory. Those are the uh, those are the classes that are part of that protocol and all together in one place. Um, but that the, one of the problems with that is that other people see useful bits from your protocol, then then they have to uh, they have to be lower in the um, library structure than you are. Um, so what the, the 
alternate uh, development modes where you, you break your project. Well, I mean, uh, usually you start off with one directory in the code call. You start putting code there. And then as you go along, you think, you know what? This little chunk right here is really general. Like, I'm just doing like a matrix inversion. That can live uh, really high in, in the libraries. So you move that up into numeric. Right? And then now that's suddenly available to a lot of people who are, who are you know, possibly higher in protocols or mature who are coming up. Um, so I, I much prefer people spread out their code sort of in terms of uh, levels of generality. How, how many things could this be beneficial for? And if it's like thousands of things and hard blown to utility, if it's, um, if it's like uh, one thing as well as maybe not the code lower level. Yeah, I, as an example, uh, the kinematic closure stuff. Uh, the actual kinematic mover that will perform the closure lives in protocols three, but the math that it's doing behind the scenes to solve that 16 order polynomial is in numeric. Any more questions? All right, great. So I guess we're taking a break now.